Uh, welcome back, everyone. Today is the second day of practice to pass session, and uh, I'm Sayed Amjad Hussain. I'm teaching SBR and Scan School and College Accountancy, all in the campus. And uh, yesterday we have gone through the overview of SBR syllabus, how the examiner is going to test. The knowledge you have gained during the study of your SBR course syllabus and how the knowledge would be testable in different section of your exam paper and what are the main ideas, what are the main requirements when you're looking into your exam pattern and what you should consider while answering your question within the practical exam scenario. Along with that, as this is the first session, for computer-based exams so we have gone through the CBE environment computer-based examination environment uh, a platform which give you an idea how the examination would be held and how the exam is going to test you um, within your exam so we have looked into all those aspects if anyone has any question with respect to the yesterday uh, topics so do let me know uh, I, I'll, I'll be answering your question. If no, then we are going to start our today's session, uh, which is day two. And uh, today we'll be looking into the question number one of your question paper, which is related to the consolidation, consolidated financial statements, specifically IFRS 10, 11, IFRS 3, IS 28, and IFRS 12. So all of these five standards are more or less bit related to consolidated financial statements. So we'll be looking into all of these five standards today. So anyone has question with respect to the yesterday topic, uh, I'll be glad to answer this. COVID-19 issue, related issues, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on accounting. I think that yes, there is an impact and there are multiple topics, multiple discussions available which are explicitly mentioning, explicitly seeing how this COVID-19 has actually impacted the financial statement of the organizations. But as far as uh, main concern, main idea is that everything is going to smoothen down once again and business environment is opening up so most of the businesses have created losses but with the revival of the economy with the um, with like the institution of all the business activities the businesses are going to be profitable once again so mainly i would recommend that if there is any impact of is uh, covid 19 specifically that could be an indicator of impairment for certain assets but might not be they could be possible that certain businesses grow very faster compared to other businesses certain businesses go downsides specifically in a line industry hits has got a very huge impact on its business activities <clears throat> so uh right now i don't have any plan to uh, go through this impact of covid 19 IFR 16 leases, yes, and IS 36. But every standard might have an impact of COVID-19, depending upon the situation or the scenario that was provided by the examiner. So it's all dependent upon your understanding, right? So this is something it, it could be possible, uh, but there are, if I have multiple questions I've seen over here, so, Exactly, that comes, that comes. Uh, sorry, someone has sent the question that there is a rent concession provided by the landlord or, or the lesser. So it has an impact on IFRS 16. Yes, I hope you, everyone of you have looked into IFRS 16 um, modification of lease terms and conditions. And those modifications are actually part of 
those requirements. So it's not something there is a new standard available. It's something that there is a guideline already available within the standard. You need to apply that guideline with respect to COVID-19 situation, right? So I don't think there is a specific guideline for COVID-19 within the accounting standard. Examiner might ask you a situation which could be accounted for within the existing standard. It will give you a guidance the existing standard have given you a guidance how this idea should be accounted for. For example, there is someone who has uh, sent me a question. Uh, <clears throat> there are multiple questions, so uh, let's look into one by one question uh, with respect to COVID-19, IES 16, um, subsequent adjustment or subsequent amendments to the lease agreement should be accounted for, like uh, I hope you or everyone have, you have studied if there is a, if there is a lease payment, if there is a lease payment, which is depending upon the uh, you can say indexed rate. So the lease payment should be accounted for or should be reassessed year over year and that directly impact the lease obligation. And second thing is that is the right to use asset and onward you are supposed to account for the changes you have made. So COVID-19 impact if there is a lead lease uh, curtailment within within the lease term, then you have to account for it as, as an amendment to the lease contract. Second, there is another question someone asked about uh, the security guards. We have less, last day we have discussed about the dogs. Those those were purchased or those were acquired by a security company, and the dogs were actually acquired with an intention to help the guards to fulfill their duties. So in this case, initially you are going to record those dogs under IS 16, and later on that should be accounted for under the model of either a cost model or a revaluation model. That is, subsequently you have to depreciate those dogs based on an estimated useful life of those dogs. And if there is any residual value, obviously you need to account those for. Uh, I hope I have answered that question. Uh, your recording is available, I believe, and uh, most probably um, ACCA will guide you how you can looking into the yesterday's webinar. We also word sheet. Okay, if you are supposed to provide calculation within the Excel sheet and you are making some sort of uh, your calculation aspect within the uh, word, oh, sorry, the the other part of your answer that is the discussive portion calculation portion is basically done on excel sheet and discussive portion most probably done on uh, should be done on word sheet so if you are if you want to like link the calculation within your answer you can go back and through to the excel and word sheet or you can show those sheet alongside to make sure that you are answering your question but as far as examination or the reviewer is concerned or the person who is looking into your examination who is giving you mark marks he'll be looking into your answer with respect to the caption you have provided at the top of your answer to which specific section this answer relates to that we have discussed yesterday so examiner is is comfortable in looking into the answer in the way you have mentioned but as far as your answer is concerned i would recommend that uh, for calculation uh, perspective you should be using the excel sheet and for uh, discussive question or descriptive answers or for for the discussion part of your answer you should be using the word sheet rather the excel sheet that's more appropriate for everyone so the linkage if you need to create a linkage so you can go back and forth to excel and worksheet or you can open excel and worksheet side by side on your computer screen so you do, do both of these two sheets are visible to you and you can answer your questions on that sheet any, any further question with respect to that if no then uh, i'll be moving to the
so there is another question which is related to the acquisition of a subsidiary and there is an inherent share based payment scheme operated by industry how should we account for such that is something we'll be looking into this aspect later first we'll be looking into question i believe uh, i don't think so i have a question right now COVID-19 does have an impact on the businesses. This is something everyone has an understanding. And obviously, if something is impacting the business, it, mu it must have an impact on accounting treatment. Uh, right now, I have not seen any article related to COVID-19, but uh, surely I'll be looking into this specific aspect in our last session, because I have already I have already in my mind about the COVID-19 section and how it's actually impacted the accounting standards, but I have not planned it for today's class. So if there is any question related to COVID-19, that would be discussed on day five, most probably, right? If we have ended our session, if we got some other issues related to this earlier, then I'd be, I'm going to discuss that one. But right now, we are looking into the consolidated financial statement with respect to uh, the exactly that so that if, if uh, i believe there are multiple options and multiple uh, answers to from uh, most of you attendees that uh, most of the entities have faced credit loss because of the COVID-19, exactly they have actually, and for that matter, they might have rescheduled their loan facilities and it might have impact on, on the financial asset they have, any entity has acquired. So impairment on financial asset must have an impact on it. So all of these things or all of these aspects will be looking into this specific section, the COVID-19 will be looking into this section later on. Right. So uh, moving back to consolidated question, because this is something how to pass the exam paper. So we're going to start this question. Uh, so the first question in our exam session is a consolidated uh, consolidation related question. And I have uh, added one question within our, our today's discussion that is December 2018 attempt question. So <clears throat> how are you going to answer your question? That's something we need to understand. And we need to make sure that any answer we have made or any answer we are going to um, deliver for, for the examination, what the examiner has provided us. So we need to consider a few of the basic criteria, few of the basic ex ideas based on which or the focus areas we need to make sure how you're going to account for these um, specific uh, with respect to a specific question. So. The very first requirement whenever you're looking into a question into your exam question you must have to understand what examiner has expected from a student what is the expectation of an examiner what he wants to know about what was done by the students second uh, thing that you need to uh, consider is you have to understand the scoring scheme the examiner has given at the end of each requirement Right. And the third thing is you have to understand the main areas of the scenario based on the scores provided within the question. You need to understand what are the main section of my scenarios uh, to which I have to, uh, to to focus on and to make sure that um, that I have I have given the most importance to those specific areas rather to the scenario overall. The fourth thing is you have to make sure you have to make your mind you have to develop an idea in your mind that how you're going to develop your answer in order to secure the maximum marks within within the question the fifth one is where i need to create the link between the different requirements provided within the question and then you need to attempt your question but before this within the 15 minutes time time span that is provided to you as a reading time pattern as a reading time for for to every student to read out the question so i would recommend if you have spent like more than 15 minutes on reading out your paper that's far more better rather haphazardly looking into the question and then answering it right away what what do you think i believe it's far more important for every student to read out the questions carefully 
to think about all these aspects what I have mentioned within this requirement and then you are going to answer your question so whenever we are looking into every question we'll be having the same idea the same theme and the same thought process that how we are going to answer our question with respect to what the examination the examiner has provided to us so uh, you guys have already the handouts available with you so right now i'm just going to open up this question right now this question is basically related to december 2018 attempt there is a background i'm going to read out this background and then we'll be looking into the main requirements the following are the extracts from the consolidated financial statements of moe's group group statement of profit and loss for the year ended 30th september 2008 is given below so this is something you have provided with a profit and loss account group profit and loss account or a consolidated statement of profit and loss account statement of co uh, comprehensive income and you are also provided with few of the extracts from the group statement of financial position so these are the extracts that are provided to you and you need to account for with this aspect so i'm not reading out these they are just three aspects even from these two main areas from these two main areas i can have an idea that uh, the examiner is going to ask me for for something a cash flow statements related to operating activities and nothing else as of now the the basic background of scenario so in the next portion i'm looking into the following information is also relevant for the year ended 30th september 2008 there is the first portion is the pension scheme so whenever there is one section that's named as pension scheme so you must be having in your mind that most probably the, this is something related to is 19 employee benefit standard so i have yesterday i have also discussed with everyone that within the first question you don't think about it that the examiner is just looking into ifrs 10 or examiner is just asking you question with respect to is ifrs 10 or is 28 or ifrs 11 ifrs 3 no the examiner can link any standard any other standard within the consolidated section so in this portion examiner has tested ias 19 employee benefits from the students that how they are going to account for that how the pension schemes should be accounted for if those are provided within the question next section is goodwill this goodwill is related to iafrs 3 so uh, it's pretty easy for us i believe this 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 adjustment is not something a very technical adjustment then not only this the next requirement was related to IES 16 property plant and equipment. You can see here property plant and equipment PPE at 30th September 2006 include cash additions of 134 million depreciation charge during the year of 99 million and impairment loss of 43 million was recognized. Prior to the impairment, the group had a balance on the revaluation surplus of 50 million of which 20 million related to property plant and equipment in the current year. So that's that's a main requirement for IES 16 property plant and equipment. And along with it, the examiner has also tested IES 36 within the same requirement, right? Next is IES 12, sorry, IES 2 inventories. This is something uh, inventory question was related here, but this section is specifically related to intra-group transaction within the group if there is any sale or purchase so how you are going to account it for and not only this there is also i think a foreign exchange um foreign exchange data that was also tested for so ias 21 is also tested within this section goods were purchased from dinar 80 million cash when the exchange rate was dollar one dinar five moes had not managed to sell the goods at 30th september 2008 and the net realizable value was estimated to be dinar 60 million at 30th september uh, okay and uh, 30, uh, value was estimated to be dinar 60 million 30 september the exchange rate at the date was dollar one equals dollar dinar six the inventory have been Correctly valued at 30th September 2008 with both exchange differences and impairment correctly included within the cost of sales. So this basic section is related to IS2 inventories along with it IS21 foreign exchange were also accounted for within this section. Then changes in group structure. This is something uh, a change in group structure was also mentioned. So IFRS10 was 
tested here. During the year ended 30th September 2008, Moe's acquired a 60% subsidiary Devonport and also sold all of its equity interest in Graham for cash. The consideration for Devonport constitutes of a share for share exchange, a law together with some cash payable in two years. 80% of the equity shares of Graham had been acquired several years ago, but Moe's had decided to sell all the uh, sell as the performance of Braham had been poor for a number of years. Consequently, Braham had a subsequent substantial overdraft at the disposal date and Braham was unable to pay any dividends during the sorry during the financial year but Devonport did not pay an interim dividend on 30th September 2008. So next is discounted operation that is IFRS 5 non current asset held for sale and discounted operation so this is also uh, tested here the directors of Moyo's wishes to advise as to whether the disposal of Graham should be related as a discounted operation and separately disclosed within the consolidated statement of profit and loss account there are several other subsidiaries which all produce similar products to Graham and operate in a similar geographical area additionally Moyo's hold a 52% equity interest in Watson Watson has previously issued share options to other entities which are exercisable in the year ended 30th September 2009. It is highly likely that these options would be exercised which would reduce Moyo's interest to 35%. The directors of Moyo's require advice as to whether this loss of control would require Watson to be classified as held for sale and reclassified as discontinued operations. So this is the whole scenario, different scenarios provided within your exam section. Now, one more thing that we need to look into the requirement and the marks allocation scheme. So first thing is draft an explanatory note to the directors of Moyo's which should include a calculation of cash generated from operation using indirect method. So you are supposed to use a calculation of cash generations from operation using indirect method. Next is an explanation on specific adjustment required to the group profits before tax to calculate cash generated from operations. So we, you have two requirements actually. This first requirement is based on the calculation of how the cash generated from operations should be accounted for. The next requirement is you have to explain, you have to explain why those adjustments were made to the cash generated from operation section. So both of these two requirements, what I believe is it could be possible that five marks should be allocated to this section and most out of these 12 marks, right? There are total 12 scores assigned to the section A, the main A requirement. So I would recommend, I would believe that five marks would be assigned to this section and seven marks should be assigned to this section. But we'll be looking into the examiner marks allocation scheme which would be available to you once you have you are done with your exam section and examiner might be giving you an idea how the scores were allocated against the calculation and the uh, discussion part of your uh, question next requirement was so this this basic requirement actually inculcates all the scenarios which are mentioned in the question so you need to understand that you have to identify any non cash items which is provided within, within any of the section of your above scenarios. Next is explain how the changes to the group structure and dividend would impact upon the consolidated shift of cash flows at 30th September 2000 from the Moyes group. If there is any dividend provided by the Moyes, how that dividend given would have impacted the consolidated cash flows. So you need to have discussed your question your discussion pattern. You have to explain these things. You should not attempt to alter your answer to part A. So you're not supposed to alter this section, right? So you only need to explain this. And if you are looking into the linkage between two, so you have to understand that the cash flows generated from operation, this is something an extension to, to that specific portion. So first you need to calculate this one. It's not directly linked with with the section one because in this attempt B in this um, requirement B examiner has specifically asked you not to include not to alter the answer in your requirement number A so you need to only explain what you have done over here how the dividend if paid by 
Moyo's companies had impacted the cash flow shipment. So you need to be very careful how those dividends should be impacted. Next three section C is or the C requirement is advise the director as to whether Watson should be classified as held for sale and whether both it and both it means both Watson and Braham should be classified as this country the both both of these two subsidiaries those were disposed of if we can mention these two subsidiaries as this kind of operation or uh, non current as or discount operation and held classified as held for sale under IFRS 5 or not. So, you have to understand what are the IFRS 5 requirements. There is one another section, D section, and that's something I've mentioned. This is related to the conceptual framework, right? So, 2018 version of conceptual framework of financial reporting, the conceptual framework of international accounting standard board specifies that it must meet two fundamental qualitative characters. I am, I don't, I don't think so that uh, you might not have an idea i believe everyone has an idea that recognition criteria for assets and liabilities have been changed by the conceptual framework right now the conceptual framework believes that it's not the criteria of probability which was mentioned by the earlier version of conceptual framework that if it is probable that outflow or inflow of economic benefit arises towards an entity or out of the entity uh, outflows was from the entity economic outflows are done from the entity in future if it has a probable chances then you have to record that as 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 an asset or a liability right but now the recognition criteria have been changed now conceptual framework specifically mentioned that if the two fundamental qualitative criteria one is relevance and the faithful representation have been met like if any asset by disclosing or by recognizing any asset within the financial statement give more faithful representation to the stakeholder or to the user of the financial statement then you are supposed to provide that um, that asset you have to recognize that asset within the financial statements and if it provide more relevance data to the users of financial statement then whatever the asset or liability is so that asset or liability should be provided in financial statement rather considering the probable inflow or outflow related to that asset or liability right so that's the change done in 2018 uh, conceptual framework so current accounting standard have been criticized for not necessarily applying the recognition criterion relating to assets and liabilities on consistent basis so that's one of the objection provided by many of the stakeholders that framework has been changed definition of assets and liabilities have been changed but the recognition criteria mentioned in each and every standard has not been changed the standard are saying the same recognition criteria going forward and they, the the criteria within the standards have not been changed uh, as the as the conceptual framework has been changed so you need to required in this case is explain how the new criterion has been applied consistently account across accounting standards so you need to make sure you have to explain how the change criteria was consistently applied across accounting standard you need to illustrate your answer with respect to with reference to how there are inconsistencies with the measurement of intangible assets provision contingent consideration you need to also explain how change in conceptual framework had impacted the existing accounting standard and you can see here it's a six mark question so in total you have 30 marks available if you look into it the marking scheme so this is the marking scheme that was provided by the examiner so calculation of cash flows generated from operation should be given a six marks explanation of adjustment and use of a scenario was also given a six mark number so you have 12 in total for requirement a for requirement b you are given a six marks one mark for purchase consideration shares and deferred cash consideration second one is impact and consolidated statement of cash flows of a subsidiary acquisition including dividend and subsidiary disposal was given with two marks question that's a b requirement then section c was ifrs5 definition of discounted operation and application to the scenario so that's something which is given with the three marks consideration of held for sale and application to the scenario will given with one mark and consideration of loss of control and application to the scenario is 
given with two marks. So this is how the score allocation was done within the examination section. And D is inconsistencies application of probability criterion, including examples number three and proposed changes to the criterion which was also given with three scores. So in total, you are provided with the six scores in this section. So right now, if I'm moving to answer this question before this, I just want to give you an overview of cash flow. So we'll be moving to the cash flow sections, how the cash flows would be impacted or how we are going to account for the cash flows. So important thing is you have already studied basic cash flows within your previous studies that was financial reporting paper and in SBI you'll be provided with consolidated cash flows. So as far as I'm giving you an idea if there is a difference between two I recommend there is no difference between basic cash flows and consolidated cash flows right cash flows should always be created from or should always be prepared from the basic two financial statements once the income statement and balance sheet have been prepared only then a uh, cash flow uh, can be can be prepared so once the consolidated statement of comprehensive income and consolidated statement of uh, financial position was created by the accountants only then our consolidated cash flows can be created can be prepared before this you cannot create it so one important thing is we need to consider what is the impact on consolidated cash flows so two main differentiations between individual cash flows what you have studied earlier and consolidated cash flows is you need to make sure in in consolidated cash flows what is the impact on consolidated cash flows if a subsidiary was purchased or sold during the year that's one criteria and we have seen in our exam section the examiner has specifically asked you what is the impact if a subsidiary was disposed of during the year from the group accounts and how it has impacted the consolidated cash flow sections and if you want me i can give you an idea over here uh, this is change in group structure you can see here this is the change in group structure when moyos acquired a subsidiary devon pop uh, devon port and also sold in trust equity interest in braham for cash right so they are there's a change in group structure if the company if the group has disposed of a subsidiary there might have an impact on the consolidated cash flows and if the company or if the group has acquired a subsidiary that also has an impact and how that impact should be accounted for we'll be looking into the format i have mentioned here and second thing is the the next important part is and believe you me i have accounted for i believe i have accounted for both of these two in our questions i have another question in which we will be looking into how the impact of foreign exchange gain losses but it's not specific to the cash flows but we're looking into it how the foreign exchange gain losses on consolidated cash flows should have impacted but these are the two main differences between the individual cash flows and consolidated cash flows so let's look into cash flow segments how the cash flow segment should be prepared so presentation and preparation of cash flows should be it was very much explained in IES 7 uh, the cash flow statements standard one important idea is whenever you are studying any standard whenever you are looking into accounting concepts when you're looking into the conceptual framework we always study that accounting is based on accrual basis of accounting right but cash flow statement is the only statement in in within the statement of uh, within the financial statement which was prepared on cash basis of accounting so you need to be very careful whenever you are answering your question that this is the only statement that is based on cash basis right rather on accrual basis of accounting so we're going to account for it how we will be impacting it so there are three main sections which was provided by IES 7 and it it explains that there are three sections those are divided cash flows from operating activities cash flows from uh, finance investing activities and cash flows from financing activities so these are the three main sections of your cash flows those were explained by IES 7 that how these three sections should be accounted for we'll be looking into into the details of this section but right now what I'm going to tell you is if and only indirect method and direct method there are two basic methods provided by IES 7 so uh, another thing that I, I'm going to explain to you is 
there is an inconsistency within IES 7. So IES 7 has never mentioned that irrespective it's depending upon the discretion of the company that whether the company is going to use a direct method or an indirect method. So whatever method the company has provided should be looking looked into. If uh, if, if, if a, a company is using an indirect method for the preparation of cash flows and a company B is using a direct method then there is still a problem of comparability. I hope you recall something from your framework. The framework has provided a criteria or characteristics that is the financial sector should be comparable. You might have looked into they are two basic qualitative characters fundamental qualitative characters and additional qualitative characteristics so the additional qualitative characteristics it was mentioned that the data provided by the company should be comparable to comparable to whom the framework mentioned comparable to the previous data reported by the company itself and with the rest of the industry so if two companies are working within the same industry within the same business sector and the company is preparing one company is preparing financial statement based on indirect method and other companies preparing the financial statement based on direct method this financial statements or the cash flows is not comparable so there is an inconsistency within IES 7 right now so that's something whenever you are mentioning some whenever whenever the examiner is going to ask you to criticize about IES 7 you can mention this criticism on IES 7 but we're not here to look into the crit in, uh, criti uh, criticism on IES 7 right now we're looking into how cash flows should be prepared I'm giving you an idea so cash flows from operating activities if you are looking into direct and indirect methods so differences only based on cash flows from operating activities rest cash flows from investing activities irrespective if you are uh, preparing cash flows from investing activities under direct method or indirect method both of these two remains the same there is no difference between these two right only difference between direct and indirect method is that you are uh, you have to prepare cash flows uh, from operating activities in a different way under both these two methods direct and indirect method so right now uh, i am not expecting that examiner is going to ask you to uh, use a direct method but that's something my understanding it's not something that you should ignore it all together the examiner okay fine examiner is not asking me uh, to apply direct method examiner can ask you examiner has all the authority and I have all the rights to ask you how uh, to prepare cash flows using a direct method so it's not difficult one it's easy one but you should be very cautious about it when a direct method is used under direct method you should only consider it uh, the cash flows total cash inflows and you have to deduct total cash outflows that's the only difference all the cash inflows given within the scenario you have to account for within this section but you need to be very careful what cash receipts should be included I I'll be looking into this aspect later on so a cash flow some indirect method should already started from net profit before tax and you need to make certain adjustments those adjustments comes from you can see here I have mentioned over here the format of an income statement so the, if this is the income statement you have to start with profit before taxation right from this section profit before taxation and you need to move reverse within your income statement and adjust all those expenses and income which are non-cash in nature right so you can look into it I have already adjusted those within this section net profit depreciation amortization impairment and plus expense allowances income from associates investment income and gain on disposal of non-current assets so all of these items are non-cash items just giving you an idea if anyone has any confusion about it if in trust expense is is either a cash or a non-cash expense so i i'll ask you guys to recall is ifrs 9 within ifrs 9 when you are charging interest expense that interest expense should always be charged based on effective interest rate right that effective interest rate was calculated based on irr model but interest payment was based on always based on the nominal interest rate and in most of the scenarios a nominal interest rate and effective interest rate are different so the company has charged a different interest expense while the company has paid a different amount with respect to that interest payment so that's always different so i would say that interest expense is something different allowances 
is, is another way. Income from associate, IS21, if everyone is clear about it, you have to take the share of profit of associate and in, include that share of profit of associate within your consolidated financial statement, the consolidated income statement. But the associate has not delivered the cash against the income you have recognized in your income statement. Associate might have given you some sort of dividend and that dividend was deducted, that dividend should be deducted from investment in associate from your balance sheet or statement of, company, a statement of financial position. I hope you understand. So this is also a non-cash item. So once you have adjusted all the non-cash items till income statement, till this point, the gross profit, before the gross profit, right? So you have made all the adjustments. Once you've made all the adjustment, you need to be looking into these two items, revenue, cost of goods sold and gross profit. I would say we're not going to make any adjustment using under indirect method with all of with these three items because these three items should automatically be accounted for when you're looking into the current asset section and current liability section, that is the working capital. I have, completed this income statement within my under my cash flow statements now i'm looking into the balance sheet and i'll be moving back to my question once i'm done with this i have a few of the adjustments and we'll be looking into those adjustments then we're moving we jumping to our question because we have understood the main idea of how we are going to answer the question second thing is your balance sheet so as the cash flow was generated or prepared from balance sheet and income statement so we are done with our income statement aspect except only these these three items so once you are looking into the working capital section that is the current assets and the current liabilities so these changes should be made to the operating activities you can see here over here this cash flows before working capital changes increase decrease in receivables payables and inventory you have made this adjustment over here right and then you will be making further adjustment that was in trust paid and tax paid and you can see here i have made the adjustments right and then i'll be looking into current liabilities and those current liabilities would also be adjusted in working capital changes cash flows from operations so this is i have mentioned in 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 a, in, in, in abbreviation so that uh, it will not take a lot of space and we can easily understand you have seen there are just two items left that is under current liabilities it's bank overdraft and under current assets had its cash and ca cash so these should be accounted for under cash and cash equivalent that was the last head of your your cash flows second thing you have to account for the taxes paid and interest paid right so interest paid and taxes paid should be accounted for if there is some interest provided interest payable within your income state balance sheet under the current liabilities had in taxes paid you need to make sure once you are finding out how you need to find out the taxes paid this tax paid should always include consider the defer tax and the current tax that's really important to understand if you remember ias 12 defer taxation or taxation standard the current tax or the tax charged to the profit and loss account for the current year is based on three items one was the current tax that was provided by the taxation authorities second was over and under provision that was based on on the previous year estimates and third thing is your deferred tax which is based on the differentiation of uh, of the taxation rules and accounting rules so you will be looking into the temporary differences but that that's something uh, part of other any other course so once you are done with cash flows from operations, you need to be looking into cash flows from investing activities. So you have to be, you have to make sure in your mind, investment means what? Investment means I have invested few of the cash into some other activity and from where I want a return. So what is the section in your balance sheet that 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 fulfills this basic requirement? And I believe that's a non-current asset section you have invested some amounts within any other activity to get the return to get the profits from from that specific asset so whenever you're looking into cash flows from investing activities you should only be considering this non-current asset section of your balance sheet 
right so anything that comes under non current asset section should always be accounted for under cash flow from investing activities right except any item which was related to the day to day operation activities if if something is related to day to day operation that should comes under the head of cash flow from operations last thing that's the third uh, section or third portion of your cash flow statement which is named as cash flow from financing activities what financing actually means financing means the business has gained funds from whom to 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 get some benefit out of those uh, to 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 run its businesses so i believe business has only two options available to get the finance from either from lenders that is non current liabilities or from the shareholders so these are the two main sections one is the capital section and other one is this the non current liability section that should be accounted for under cash flows from financing activities rest this bank overdraft is should be accounted for under cash and cash equivalents and, and you can see here this is the cash and cash equivalent item that should be accounted for opening cash and cash equivalent closing cash and cash equivalent so this is how it should be accounted for now just giving you an idea so cash and i'm not looking into cash and cash equivalent i'm just looking into if you have acquired if a subsidiary acquired or disposed of during the year what you need to do is first thing is any cash received or paid for the acquisition of a subsidiary or from the disposal of subsidiary if you have received the cash if you have received cash by disposing of a subsidiary i have an example for example if you have paid cash to acquire a subsidiary so effectively you have lost control over this amount because you have delivered this cash to someone else but once you have acquired a subsidiary you have acquired a control on the cash which is retained within the subsidiary right so the so the net impact the net loss of control on the cash is 80000 you have lost control over 100000 and you have gained the cash which is which you have gained the control with the acquisition of a subsidiary is 20000 that is within the subsidiary right so you need to account for only the net impact of cash within your consolidated cash flows that's something the first idea whenever you have acquired a subsidiary so you need to look into the net position of the cash impact so if you have disposed of a subsidiary so we'll be looking into cash received by disposing of a subsidiary so you have effectively gained the control over 100000 you have gained a control because if you have sold the subsidiary you have received the cash and you have gained the control over an asset which is cash which is 100000 but once you are disposing of a subsidiary so the outgoing subsidiary take the cash along with it like this 20000 cash that is within the subsidiary so you have lost the control of 20000 cash along with the loss of control on a subsidiary right so the net cash you have gain control over it that's 80000 is the same case so whenever you are looking into into the cash provided delivered for the acquisition of a subsidiary or cash received from disposing of a subsidiary that should always be accounted for in a net position now i'm going going back to give you a linkage between these two this investment in subsidiary should be accounted for under non current asset section right so non current asset section once we are looking into the format of ia of cash flows we have identified that non current asset section should be accounted for under cash flows from investing activities right so this cash paid for the acquisition of subsidiary or cash received by disposing of a subsidiary this 80000 should be accounted for under cash received or paid or cash under the your cash flows from investing activities i hope uh, it's pretty much clear to everyone how this should be accounted for and we're going to relate it to our question to into that question next is if you have acquired a subsidiary during a year if you have acquired a subsidiary during the year every item in a balance sheet must be adjusted for as a result of sale of a subsidiary or acquisition of a subsidiary so 
to give you an easy understanding if you have acquired a subsidiary or if you have disposed of a subsidiary so you have to change the opening or the closing balances of of, of every account within that scenario for example if non-current assets net book value of, of a group net non-current asset of a group have a net book value of one like fifty thousand right and you have made an accumulated you have charged an accumulated depreciation or depreciation of twenty thousand to the financial statements of the current year so twenty thousand accumulated depreciation and you have disposed of i have this scenario available during the year a subsidiary was disposed of whose non-current assets of ten thousand were in the op opening balances by these were disposed of during the year and are no more in the balance sheet at the reporting date within this opening balances as the subsidiary was disposed of during the year so within these opening balances this 10000 should be available but within this closing balances this 10000 is not available so you need to make sure either you can update your closing balances or you can reduce your opening balances but i would recommend if the subsidy was disposed of then you have to consider it like disposal of your non current assets right as the subsidy was disposed of this non current asset was disposed of along with the subs subsidy disposal but you have not received any cash for the disposal of this non current asset you should you should be considering it as as an adjustment in your non-current asset section so that's how you need to account for if you have sold out a non-current asset also oh, if you have sold out a subsidiary the, the non-current asset should be adjusted accordingly within that section right next i believe the next section is exchange gain losses exchange gain losses should be accounted for in the same way each item of gain or loss should be accounted for as increase or decrease in specific element of financial statement whenever there is a foreign exchange gain or loss i believe everyone has an understanding how foreign exchange gain losses should be accounted for within the group accounting statement so if there is a foreign exchange gain or a loss for example if there is a foreign exchange gain or non-current asset then the non-current asset value the closing balance of the non-current asset value had been increased but this was not increased due to additional cash payments this was just increased due to what due to <clears throat> the foreign exchange results which is a non-cash item so if there is a non-cash item we have to exclude it so we can add that foreign exchange gains within the non-current assets of non-current assets t account so to make sure that this was adjusted so this is how you need to account for now coming back to our question how we can account for so apologies so i'll be opening up another excel sheet on which we'll be working so first thing comes first is what was the first requirement within the question the examiner has asked you to calculate cash flows generated from operations using indirect method we have to calculate the cash flows which you have um, using indirect method from this so the starting point for the cash flows would be what we need to make sure that that should be the profit before tax if there is profit before tax given the question yes we have profit before tax that's the value of 209 so cash flows from operations cash flows from operations start with profit before tax I'm, I'm mentioning it profit before tax so that's value is 209 as we have just seen into it now someone has asked me how we can account it for so you can use these two tables side by side I'm, I'm going to look into these two sections side by side so within exam section you will be provided the excel and the and the pdf file in the same pattern so uh, i'm going to zoom it out to make sure it's uh, 100 percent so so this is something we have right now and we'll be looking into these while scrolling it uh, back and forth to understand how it actually works so that's something within the exam you'll be provided with this pdf file which was pretty much clear to you and it's it's it adjusted itself within that 
section of your balance sheet so i hope it's visible to everyone uh it's if it's not visible do let me know i believe it's visible now it's it should be visible to everyone it's pretty much clear next thing that comes into uh, uh, that you should consider is as we have mentioned profit before tax this profit before tax i have told you that we need to move up in your income statement to make sure if there is any any adjustment any adjustment till this gross profit point any adjustment which is a non cash item we, should, we have to account it for and the only thing is share of profit from associate so we need to adjust it back we need to adjust share of profit from associate which is 27 as this is the profit and this profit has actually a non cash item and this non cash item has actually increased the profit before tax so i'm going to reduce it with the value of 67 minus 67 so i have deducted right because the profit was already increased now there is no other item left no other item left within this operating expenses section so what we need to do is we need to make sure we'll be moving into the notes we're moving into the disclosure notes those are provided because that item this balance sheet item should comes once you have done with all of the changes those were done within this operating expenses so first things come first the pension scheme is 19 i hope everyone has a knowledge of is 19 and how this is 19 actually works um you have to make sure there are like few of the items those were available in is 19 just uh, just looking into just looking into the brief section of is 19 uh this is employee benefits is 19 and uh, i'll be giving you a format so these are the few of the items those were reported in your uh, in your is 19 first one is the net pension plan obligation this net pension plan obligation always increase with component net interest component right and this net interest in ENT. this net interest component always is always charged to profit and loss account but do you think it is something that you have paid for the pension plan no second is the service cost component which includes both the current service cost component the previous past service cost component which includes curtailment increase and settlements and both of these two items are based on accrual basis of accounting not on a cash base of accounting the only thing that you need to make sure is contribution paid within the plan by the company that's only the cash item you have paid along all of these items next is the benefit paid i hope if you have studied is 19 you might be aware of it benefit paid is something you have pension plan assets and you have pension plan liabilities the pension plan scheme or the pension plan assets once the obligation was due you are going to pay from those pension plan assets for the pension plan liabilities so in that case if you're looking into the net pension plan obligation this net pension plan obligation if the pension plan obligation has decreased why because you have paid for those pension plan obligations from the pension plan assets so if both assets and liabilities have reduced so there is no impact on net pension plan so you have no it has no impact on your cash flows if some benefits are paid for the pension plan obligation out of those pension plan assets so this has no impact on our cash flows last thing is the remeasurement component and you always know this remeasurement component is actually a balancing figure that 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 should be accounted for so this even this remeasurement component has no impact now we'll be moving back to our question because we have identified how this is 19 standard actually works now if you're looking into it moyos operate a defined benefit scheme a service cost component of 24 million has been included within the operating expenses a service cost component do you think this as we know this is an operating expense and that's charged that is charged to the profit and loss account but is it a cash flow item no it's not a cash flow item so i'm going to adjust it back a service cost component like i would say pension plan cost or pension plan expenses your pension expenses you can say employee expenses or pension i'm naming it as employee 
expenses and I would name it as related to pension right so that examiner could understand what I actually mean so uh, I'm going to adjust it 24 million because this is an expense that have already reduced this profit from tax so I'm going to add it back to increase the profit once again the remailment component for the year ended was a gain of three my three million the remailment component created a um, gain of three million so do we need to adjust it no we don't need why because we the starting point in our cash flow is profit before tax while this remailment component was adjusted in other comprehensive income so you have not accounted for the other comprehensive income why we're going to account for this item so we were going to ignore this one so whenever looking into exam you can like uh, uh, cross this one next thing is benefit paid out of the scheme was 31 million do you think this is something that you need to account it for i have already mentioned that this benefit paid was from the pension plan assets this will reduce the pension plan asset and and the pension plan assets were maintained by some insurance company or a financial institution so it's none of our business that irrespective of whatever the benefit was paid that was paid by the by, by that financial institution an insurance company or a bank or, or whatever the organization is there right so this is this is not concerned to us contribution into the scheme by moyes the moyes group has paid 15 million so this is the cash flow that was paid and as this is related to the employee expenses so it's it's cash flow from operation that should be accounted for so contribution contribution in plan was 15 million so i'm going to deduct this 15 right so we have done with this one section i hope everyone is clear how we're going to account it for don't hassle your answer or don't get hesitated and don't get uh, all the information summed up of up together you need to count for one by one you need to look into each and every aspect of your answer one by one once you are done with one requirement then move on because if i want to secure the marks i need to make sure i am understanding the basic aspect i'm looking into what was mentioned within the question and i'm going to answer that specific aspect of a question rather i'm going to answer all together at once I'll be looking into because this section has some scores allotted to it and I believe I'm not sure how many scores but we have seen it that how many adjustments are there I believe there are like five seven adjustment and for this specific adjustment I, I think there are there should be 1.5 marks given to these two adjustment what were made to this cash flow statements next is goodwill so goodwill impairment is something uh, that is always a non-cash item you have reviewed the financial assets or the goodwill of a business if that asset was impaired or not so you find out that that the that the goodwill of the company was reduced so you have charged this impairment to profit and loss account which is a non-cash item so we're going to reverse it so impairment of goodwill should be reversed because it's a non-cash item and it as it is an expense and it is already reduced oh sorry it's 10 million it has already reduced the profit so i'm going to increase it back right next is your property plant and equipment now in this property plant and equipment section you need to make sure what is charged to profit and loss account with respect to this property plant and equipment the first thing is property plant and equipment at 30th september include cash addition of 134 million you have spent cash of 134 million to acquire new non-current assets but what do you think this 134 million could be accounted for under cash flows from operating activities no it's an investing activity so you're not going to account it for this specific section we'll be moving on this depreciation charge during the year was nine the depreciation charge during the year was 99 million so this depreciation should be charged to this profit before tax and this profit before tax was reduced so we're going to reverse this depreciation charge right so i'm going to reverse this 99 million as with this expense this depreciation charge the profit was reduced i'm going to increase it back an impairment loss of 43 million was recognized in this year how much of the impairment you have charged to the profit and loss count and this impairment charge of 43 million but this is always charged during the year 
right depreciation charge during the 99 million and impairment loss of 43 million was recognized so you have recognized a 43 million impairment charge in this case right uh, prior to the impairment you need to make it prior to the impairment the group balance on the revaluation surplus was 50 million of which 20 million relates to property plant and equipment impairment in the current year so how what what do you think what was done this is something in this section not only uh, ies 16 cost model was tested in this case the examiner has also tested the revaluation model under the revaluation model if there is an impairment related to revalued asset so what you are going to do for revalued asset you should be making sure that um okay fine leave it so if there is an impairment related to a revalued asset you have to charge impairment to revaluation first and then to profit and loss account p and l account profit and loss account or you can say it's statement of comprehensive income so in this case total impairment was total impairment was charged with a value of 43 million out of this 43 million there is already a revaluation surplus of 40 million available within the revaluation surplus account out of this 40 million 20 million is related to this 43 million impairment right so how much of the impairment should be charged you can say this total impairment was divided into so separated into or divided into one is your revaluation right and second one is your profit and loss account or i would say it's other comprehensive income and profit and loss account right it's 20 million is related to other comprehensive income how much is related to profit and loss account i'm going to deduct it so it's 23 million so only 23 million of the impairment was charged to profit and loss account so in this case this 23 million should be reversed i'm going to reverse impairment because impairment expense right impairment expense related to non-current assets non-current assets was reversed with the value of only 23 million as this is an expense and that it already reduced the profit and loss so i have reversed it i hope there should be no problem till this calculation now another thing that another portion of our question is your inventory and this is by the way a complicated aspect and you need to be very very careful when you're looking into the impairment of an inventory goods were purchased for dinar 80 million of cash uh, when the exchange it was dollar one to dollar five moyos had not managed to sell the goods at 30th september 2008 right and the net realizable value was estimated to be dinar 60 million by 30th september the exchange rate for this date was dollar one to dollar 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 six the inventory has been correctly valued at uh, 30th september 2008 with both the exchange differences and impairment correctly included within the cost of sale so there are two things exchange differences and uh, and the impairment so examiner has confused you guys how you're going to account for the, this impairment i'm going to make another this is your uh, you can perform this working within the excel sheet or you can perform it somewhere else so you can say it's something workings I'm, I'm naming it as working so i have to make sure this is working one uh it's working one i'm just making it working one now i'm looking into working number two so what is working number two working number two is related to inventory you can name the above as well so that examiner would it would be easier for examiner to understand what you have done so it's related to non-current assets I'm, I'm just labeling this working one so i'm labeling the working two as inventory so uh i just uh give you a overview of is 21 now what is 21 actually relates to just giving you an idea how is 21 i believe 
if uh, will be so is 21 basically is related to three basic terminologies first one is the functional currency three basic aspects is 21 actually uh, is is concerned with three basic aspects one is the functional currency and the presentation currency you need to understand what is the functional currency of a company and what is the presentation currency and how functional and presentation currency should be accounted for right second is your individual foreign transactions transaction made by within individual customer by the companies that's something the is 21 actually relates to the third one aspect with which the is 21 mainly is focused is is the foreign operations foreign operation include that was basically a foreign subsidiary associates a joint venture or or or, or some other operations so how you're going to account for the foreign operations or the individual foreign transaction that you mentioned i'm just looking into because as far as our question is concerned right now we should be looking into this individual transaction rather into the foreign operation so this is not the foreign operation so right now i'm just going to give you an idea how the individual transaction should be accounted for <clears throat> Individual transaction, if you're looking into it, IS21 explained there are two types of transaction. One is a settled transaction and the other one is unsettled transaction. If there is a settled transaction, it must be translated on the date of transaction dates with the spot rate or, or uh, with the spot rate which was available. Spot rate is a rate that was that could be an historical rate or that could be the current rate. For example, if I have acquired the inventory on some date, that's that's the spot rate of that date and I have to translate the inventory on that specific date and then I am going to sold that inventory if within the uh, to any foreign customer so that's another day and I'm going to use that specific spot rate to translate my sales so purchase and sales should be translated uh, or based on the exchange rate available on the date of the transaction that's the spot rate average rate is something uh, which is average of uh, two two or more uh, spot rates or you can say there is another limitation or a criticism on is21 was is21 does not provide you a guideline how to calculate the average rate so every company every accountant can use his own idea how to calculate the exchange rate the, the accountant might use an opening rate and a closing rate of the year and he can divide it two to calculate the average rate or another accountant who can use every quarter and exchange rate divided by four to find out an average so that's another another thing which which i, I just want to give you a, an idea that how the criticism actually work and you need to understand once you are looking into the standard to find out what was the main idea second thing is unsettled transaction in 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 our case in this scenario we have seen that this is an unsettled transaction why unsettled transaction because we have purchased the goods but we are not able to or the Moyes group were, has had not managed to sell these goods these goods are still within the inventory of Moyes company right the Moyes group so this was an unsettled transaction if the inventory was purchased and it was sold out during the year so it was a separate transaction but right now it's not a separate transaction so we need to make sure this is an unsettled transaction if it is an unsettled transaction you need to make sure unsettled transaction should be differentiated between monetary and non-monetary items i believe i have unsettled transaction you need to identify two things whether the item under consideration is a monetary item or a non-monetary item right if it is a monetary item you have to retranslate that item at the reporting date and if it is a non-monetary item then you're not supposed to retranslate it once again right but in this case if i'm looking into it inventory is always a non-monetary item if anyone has a problem with respect to uh okay if someone has asked uh, give me a second 
contribution in the plan contribution in a plan uh, um, someone has asked me is and uh, let me complete this one and then I'll, I'll be going back just looking into is 21 and looking into inventory adjustment and then i'll be coming back to your questions if i missed any one question do let me know i'll be answering it again but right now i'm looking into is 21 so we have monetary items and non-monetary items monetary items if anyone has confusion i'm going to explain it what is the meaning of monetary items monetary item means it is an item which is basically which can be basically allocated with the specific units of currency and most of the students uh, i got an understanding they have confusion between monetary and non-monetary items so non-monetary item is an item which to which we cannot assign a specific units of currency example includes monetary items includes loan receivables payables cash and 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 many other like this once you're looking into non-monetary items non-monetary items includes property plant and equipment inventories and uh, buildings and the land and, and 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 any other item that 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 should be accounted for in this way to which you cannot assign a specific units of currency if someone has confusion i have a bit of explanation explanation here i believe i have here and if i got that one then i'm going to uh, explain that to you so that's that's the explanation for if you think if you have a problem with monetary and non-monetary this is something i have explained it so i have mentioned exact unit of currency for example i have mentioned here over here a loan right and i have named land as a non-monetary item to make an understanding most of the students told me that um uh, Amjad, if 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 we have a loan, then the value of loan would be changed with the interest amount. I would say yes, I agree. The loan value would be changed with the interest you're going to charge, right? But if we are considering that we have a land of one hundred thousand, principal amount is one hundred thousand, and we have a loan with a principal amount of one hundred thousand, same, we have purchased a land. For 100,000, and we have acquired a loan of 100,000. Both of these two things are same. We have purchased a loan note, which was issued by some other individual, and he's paying me the interest, which was my interest income. And I have acquired a land of the same value, 100,000. I have rented it out to some tenant who is giving me a rent on a monthly basis. Suppose interest is 10,000. On this loan note, 100,000 loan note. In the same way, rent on that property was 10,000, and the value of the building would remain same. Now, if we're going to exclude this rent and this interest, it means that both the earning elements of the assets were disconnected from the asset, right? Now, if someone is going to ask me or if someone can tell me whether the loan value is going to change other than this interest it's never gonna possible this loan value will remain same it's 100,000 for year one it's 100,000 for year two and it's 100,000 for year three if 10,000 was the interest that was charged and you are paying the 10,000 in the same way you have land element which cost you 100,000 and the rent was 110,000 and that rent was paid on monthly basis or on annual basis, right? So there is nothing other element that's going to ch change this loan value, right? But if you look into the principal market value of land, its value is going to change. In the year one, it's 100,000. In year two, it might be 200,000. In year three, it might be three like 50,000. It's never gonna stick together. You cannot assign an exact unit of currency, but because the land value is appreciating day by day, as far as loan is concerned, its value can never appreciate, right? So over here, if we, if you have understood the monetary and non-monetary item differentiation, I'll be moving back to IS21, where we will, where we have discussed identify things as. A monetary item and non-monetary item now we have understood that inventory is a non-monetary item but if there is an impairment on inventory what we can do that there is another concern you would be given a scenario in your textbooks that if you have a building a non-monetary item which is a 
which is situated in some other country and you cannot assign the value to that specific non-monetary item within your functional currency it should be reported in a foreign currency right so you have to revalue that asset and if there is any revaluation how you can account it for the revaluation and the foreign exchange gain on that foreign non current asset should be treated as a revaluation surplus rather treat rather separating the foreign exchange gain losses and and the revaluation surplus in a same way if in, you are going to look into the inventory inventory is also a non monetary asset right and if you are going to charge an imp because is2 said that inventory should always be recorded initially it should be recorded at cost and subsequently it should be recorded at lower of cost or nrv so if the nrv net realizable value of that inventory was reduced right then you have to charge an impairment to profit and loss account and if it's a foreign inventory if it's a foreign inventory and you cannot assign a value to that inventory within your functional currency you have to retranslate that inventory within the uh, within within your functional currency and if there is any impairment you have to record it now one more thing i missed over here or i skipped is what is the importance of your functional currency and presentation currency so functional currency identification is far more important why because every transaction which was made in any other currency then the functional currency should be translated first into the functional currency and then it could be recorded in your books of accounts before translating any transaction which was not done in the functional currency of the company should be first translated within the functional currency using the spot rates and then it can be recorded in your books of accounts i hope you understand this functional currency concept now we'll be looking into how this inventory should be accounted for so when you have purchased this inventory you have purchased this inventory on moes had not managed to sell so when the inventory was purchased suppose it's it's uh, purchase date um, it, as the date was not mentioned so i'm going to purchase date of this inventory on this date you have purchased an inventory of 80 million dollars suppose it's if it's 80 million dollars so 1 dollar equals 5 dinars so how many dollars it become as the dollar is smaller and dinar is has is a higher number so as a result if we are going to translate these dinars into dollars then we must get a lower value so i'm going to divide it with five so it's 16 million dollars i'm going to change i'm going to convert these dollars right into oh, sorry these dinars into dollars so i have converted on purchase date what about on the reporting date value of this reporting date value of this inventory so it has mentioned that net realized we can see here the company has purchased these goods or these inventories for 80 million dinars that 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 equals 16 million dollars right but moe was not able to moe's has had not managed to sell the goods at 30th september 2008 and the net realizable value is estimated to be dinar 60 million so if it's a 60 million dinars you can say right in this case it's a 60 million dinar 60 million dinars but what was the exchange rate over here the exchange rate was dollar one dollar equal to six dinars so the value of this inventory at reporting date would be 10 million so any difference any reduction in the inventory value is should be reported as impairment right so how much is the reduction the reduction value is this value minus this 10 so 6 million is the impairment that should be reported on inventory i hope everyone get the point why i am not differentiating between the foreign exchange gain losses and the impairment charge because it's a non-monetary item right and i have to charge any foreign exchange gain losses along with the impairment to the profit and loss account so i'm not going to bifurcate between the foreign exchange gain losses and and the impairment loss on this inventory value right so that's that's not the point so any amount that is that is the decrease in value of inventory should be charged directly to profit and loss account and we have seen here that impairment is dollar six million and that that impairment was charged to profit and loss account. i'm going to reverse that impairment right so 
I'm going to reverse this impairment over here. And what was the value of impairment of inventory? Expense, impairment expense that's related to, right, that's related to inventory. How much the value is? Loss on inventory or impairment of inventory was dollar six million. So as this was charged to profit and loss, I'm going to reverse it, right? So I have made uh, this adjustment. Now looking into changes in group structure. So this is the next point where we're going to mention it. But uh, before this, before this, these two adjustments, I'll be looking at your question and I'll be looking if if someone has any any concern so i'll be asking um i'll be i'll be explaining it uh, sure i'll be going out for a break for uh for 15 to 20 minutes so just just um give me five ten minutes uh i'll be going through your question and then i'll be going out for a break uh, so uh, what is uh, I hope uh, I have answered the question why are not we bifurcating exchange loss and in impairment of an inventory because it's a non-monetary item and if is 21 explicitly refused because we are not going to retranslate non-monetary items on the reporting date but to calculate the impairment it's it's something required for us it's something required for us to retranslate it because without retranslating we don't get the we won't get an idea what is the value of that that inventory on the reporting date, right? If you get the point or not, if, if there is still confusion, do let me know. But because IS21 strictly prohibits a non-monetary item should never be retranslated. In this case, as the net realizable value of inventory was provided in the foreign currency, it's not in the functional currency, it's in foreign currency. What is foreign currency? Any currency which is not the functional currency of the company is a foreign currency. So as the value of that uh, inventory was provided in foreign currency we have to have translated into our functional currency to find out if there is if if the value of the inventory remains same or it has changed right but as the inventory value might have reduced due to impairment as some of the value of inventory was reduced due to the impairment loss and few of the inventory value was reduced due to um, the foreign exchange loss so uh, we are not going to bifurcate these two. We should be reporting as a club amount within the profit and loss amount as impairment because IS21 disallow uh, retranslation of any non-monetary item. I hope it's pretty much clear. So, non-current asset held for sale accrued expenses and period expenses in the balance sheet of a group. Uh, so non-current asset held for sale and accrued expenses and prepaid expenses accrued expenses and prepaid expenses if they are related then they should be treated as operating expenses because those expenses are related to operations so you need to understand whether these expenses are related to operate operations or, or to something else if this is related to operation then it should be accounted for under operating activities uh, I hope I have answered how do we bifurcate impairment loss or exchange loss. We're not going to bifurcate the impairment loss or exchange loss uh, in any way because this is not allowed by IS21. Uh, if you have a question related to this one, that inventory value is two inventory uh, inventory values uh, should be over here in, in working two we are supposed to apply is to inventory so inventory should always be recorded lower of cost or nrv in subsequent measurement right in this case if i'll be looking into uh, this requirement so this is the nrv that was provided right so the cost was 16 million in functional currency and at reporting date 
we have seen that NRV was reduced to 10 million. So we have to record the inventory at 10 million rather than 16 million. So if you're going to reduce the value of the inventory by 6 million, so inventory should be credited and impairment loss to profit and loss count should be debited. That should be charged to profit and loss count to make sure that that was charged to, to, uh, to that, that year's income statement. Benefit paid into the into the pension. Okay, there's one more question. Uh, instead of inventory, if we have a monetary item, then we will separate foreign exchange losses and impairment. Yes, we need to. If there is a monetary item, you need to differentiate between the foreign exchange loss and and the impairment loss. If it is a uh, if it's a for, if it is a monetary item most probably in the case of IFRS 9 financial instruments. Benefits paid into the pension plan. Benefit paid, there are a lot many questions. So benefit paid within the pension plan. Now I, I'm just going to give you a clarification about this. Benefit paid within the pension plan relates to what amount it's something, you, I have already explained it, but once again, I'm going to show you why these benefit paid should not be included. It's IS 19. So you have seen here, this benefit paid is something it's paid out of these pension plan assets. This is the opening balance of your pension plan, this net pension plan obligation. This is the result of these two. It's a future obligation. You are paying for the pension plan. Suppose I would say, I'm just giving you an example. We have on 1st January, we have on 1st of January, 1st of January, I have a pension plan obligation of 100,000, right? Along with it, the fair value of pension plan assets, the company, Moe's companies had invested uh, within the pension plan assets because the company is company don't wait for it why wait for it that if the pension plan obligation was due then i'm going to pay it to the employees it's not possible because sometimes the pension plan obligation was way higher the company might not be able to pay all the pension to the employees there are a lot many employees those got retired those get their jobs done with the company and they are claiming the pension so to overcome this situation company on ongoing basis invest few of the amounts into the pension plan of its employees right and it's the responsibility of that financial institution either a bank or an insurance company or or any um investment company that's that's going to maintain your plan so you you have taken out few of the cash and paid to that financial institution so that they can purchase few of the pension plan assets, those will meet your future obligation. So fair value of your pension plan obligation would be suppose 90,000, right? So the net obligation, the net pension plan obligation would be what? The net pension plan obligation would be this 10,000 minus this 90,000. You have an obligation. The company has an obligation of 10,000, right? If there is a benefit paid by the company to the employees. So it's not the company who is paying the benefit to the employees. It's the pension plan assets which is paying to the employees. Suppose the pension plan has paid an amount of 5,000 to the employees for the for the pension of the today's year. So it for the current year. So it means the financial, the fair value of pension plan assets should reduce by 5,000. And as the pension plan asset had paid a 5,000 obligation, the obligation must have to reduce by one, 100, uh, by 5,000 again. So the net impact would be what is the impact? So uh, uh, apologies, just, just give me a second. I need to move it over here. So this is the payment. And we can see here the closing balance. So what is the closing balance after this payment? Your pension plan asset would, as your pension plan obligation would be 95,000 and your pension plan assets would be 85,000. So what is the net impact right now? You have 
an obligation of 10,000 once again. So there is no change in the obligation of the company due to the benefit paid by the pension plan fund. I hope it's it's clear. Uh, someone has told me that uh, before uh, working made before going to the changes group structure changes always impact your um, working capital along with your uh, what should I say along with your uh, uh, cash flow from operations oh, sorry cash flow from investing activities that's impact both of these two Okay, um, we we are going to have uh, 15 to 20 minutes breaks because this session got very long, and uh, I always take a break after an hour. But uh, this is a question, so it's it's not something I got a break. So we have uh, 25 minutes break. Uh, uh, after 25 minutes, we'll be joining back, and we'll be completing up this question to make sure we are we're also looking at the discussion part of this question, which is more important rather than just calculation part. We have to look into the discussion part and as I have already discussed all the standards we have to add up these standards within our discussion session right so all of these standards what we have mentioned should be part of our discussion session so the uh, descriptive part should be added up in the same way what what is uh, we, what we are actually making in our discussion over here okay uh, we'll be joining after 25 minutes a 25 minute break right okay
welcome back everyone apologies uh, i think i'm just five minutes late further so we have already discussed about the pension plan contributions i hope that's pretty much clear why did we not consider the benefits paid out i hope i have answered the question but uh, if still there is a confusion then do let me know i'll be explaining it once again but as of now we have we are done with almost all the parts someone has asked me a question how we have calculated this impairment on non current assets so the total impairment charge is 43 million on on non current assets out of this 43 million 20 million is related to the revaluation surplus that was already created right so if some amount that was charged of, of or an asset which is already revalued and there is an impairment charge to a revalued asset first the impairment is charged to the revaluation surplus before charging this impairment to profit and loss account so if there is any additional impairment if there is any additional impairment more than the revaluation surplus on a specific asset only that impairment should be charged to profit and loss account that so in this case if total of 43 million of impairment is charged to or it was recognized on a specific non current asset out of this 43 million 20 million was charged to other comprehensive income that is to the revaluation surplus account so the remaining of 23 million is only charged to profit and loss account i hope this is also clear and uh, this should be uh, clear to to those who who asked the question i'm moving to the next topic which is the group account right and uh, we'll be making it show before this group account we are done with the changes changes in the cash flow or cash flows before working capital changes cash flows before working capital changes this cash flows before working capital equals i believe 289 so this is the cash flows before working capital changes once the cash flows before working capital changes have been calculated you need to make sure if any changes made to the working capital section working capital section should includes current assets and current liabilities portion which was provided in in your question so you have inventories as there is an decrease in inventories year over year so decrease in inventories should be added up because you have freed up few of the cash that was actually tied up within the inventory so how much cash is tied up actually 165 million was the opening balance of inventory and the closing balance is 126 million right so in total 39 million of the cash flows is actually released from the inventories account but in this case if you can account for this impairment as well this is also a decrease in value of inventory which is not related to the cash release tied up in inventory so we have to exclude this as well this is not a increase in cash flow this decrease was basically due to impairment rather rather the decrease in uh, value of inventory oh. if if you are going to understand it using a t account so i'm going to give you an understanding how this t account actually works so i'm going to create a t account over here so to give you an understanding how this t account actually works so i'm going to merge so this is inventory account right inventory account a t account of inventory inventory has an opening balance of 165 million i believe 165 million while the closing balance of inventory was 125 million right so the difference between these two is this value minus this value so it's around 40 million uh, i believe it's not 40 million 126 million it's not 125 it's 126 million so this is the total decrease in inventory value but out of this decrease there is another decrease due to the impairment we can name it as impairment of inventory this was the cash released from it so we need to minus another value from it the 6 million so the total cash released due to lower in in uh, released due to lowering the inventory levels was just 33 million so this is the cash 
that was totally released out of out of the inventories that you are going you have managed it so this is the 30 this is 33 million that should be accounted for over here we have accounted it for next is your receivables so receivables is pretty simple calculation your receivables have been increased receivables have been increased with the value of 149 minus 156 million right so you have tied up another 7 million of cash within the receivables or you have given for or you can if you want to understand an increase in receivable you can consider it that you have delivered another 7 million of cash to your customers right you have delivered your further cash so that's another cash element next thing is your uh, <clears throat> increase in increase in payables so increase in payable was something 215 minus 197 million you have actually received cash another amount of 18 million of cash from your suppliers so you have not paid those suppliers yet so the total value of cash balances in this case would be this total that was 333 cash flows from operations why we are considering this cash flows from operations before charging any tax and interest as we don't have any information related to tax and uh, in trust so we cannot calculate exactly what is the total value of cash generated from operations up to the information provided in the question this is the cash flows from operation we have actually accounted for right so we have answered the requirement one you need to explain all these workings how you can explain it you need to explain share of profit from associate why this share of profit from associate was, was deducted from profit before tax you need to explain it. if you will be looking into the answer i actually i have mentioned over here so this is the second portion sorry this is, this is the second portion of your answer this is the calculation of what we have done i believe calculation might be uh, done in in some different perspective in in the excel sheet that i have made but uh, it it results in into the same value that we have calculated this 3 and the triple 3 dollars value so cash flows from operating entities are principally derived from the key trading activities of an entity so you need to be very careful it's a key trading activities this would include cash itself from sale of goods cash payment to suppliers cash payment on behalf of employees the indirect method adjusts profit or loss for the effects of transaction of non-cash nature we have already discussed any non-cash nature transaction should be reversed right any deferral accruals from the past and future operating receipts or payments of any items of income and expense associated with investing or financing cash flows should be reversed so this cash is actually related this cash is actually related to to the investing portion or investing activities of your business rather from operating activities the the cash related with the associate the share of profit of associate is an item of income associated with investing activities and so been deducted right you can see one by one every item was explained with the line by likewise cash paid to acquire property plant recruitments is in ex investing cash flows rather than an operating one so we have not included it altogether in it non cash flows which was reduced profit must must subsequently be added back including the service cost component depreciation exchange losses and impairments with an impairment of property plant and equipment the first 20 million of impairment will or will be allocated to the revaluation surplus only 23 million would have been reduced operating profits that's profit and loss account we have already discussed in, in our study and should be added back in relation to the pension scheme the re component can be ignored and it is neither a cash flow nor an expense to the prof operating profits to the profit and loss account the re component should always be charged to other comprehensive income rather to profit and loss account hence it it always it will always be ignored next thing is cash contribution should be deducted though as this represents an operating cash payment ultimately to be received by moise employees benefit paid are a cash outflow from the pension schemes rather than the moise and so should be ignored we have already discussed with the standards so whenever you are making sure uh, uh, i have already discussed in the previous session in the yesterday session that 
within the consolidated section you cannot consider yourself that examiner is going to ask you to adjust or to make adjustment based on operating cash flow or based on the consolidated adjustments examiner can test any standard within the consolidation section to make sure that the examiner has a vast room available with him to test the knowledge of your accounting standard within any part of your examination because this examination is basically based on your understanding about the standard so if you look into the explanation you have you have you have to create a link what this explanation means i have told you earlier that this explanation is just like the notes you are going to add the disclosure notes you are going to add to the financial statement the fifth financial statement but is notes to the financial statement so in this paper examiners try to make sure that you are prepared well about how you are disclosing the information you have updated in your financial statement this is the this is the cash flow statement and this these are the disclosure notes you are preparing for those cash flow statements right so this is how you would be explaining your answer but this is always based on the standard in any of your our answer we'll be never looking into it that examiner is asking you to add some other explanation examiner is always asking you to add an explanation based on your understanding about the international accounting standard board international accounting standards provided by international accounting standard board and the framework you are provided with right uh, along with it you need to um, provide some interpretation of of the data provided to you within your exam so this is something we have we have we're done with uh, cash contribution should be deducted uh, though as these operating cash flows and benefit paid uh, is a cash flow from the pension scheme rather than moyos so it should be ignored the movements on the receivables and payables and inventory are adjusted so that the timing differences between when cash is paid or received when the items are accrued in the financial statements are accounted for inventory is measured at lower of cost or nrv we have already discussed the inventory has suffered an overall loss of 0.6 million 80 million dinars divided by 5 minus 60 million divided by 6 of this 2.7 million is an exchange loss and 3.7 million is, is an impairment loss right neither of those are cash flows and should be added back to the profit and loss account so that that's something if you are looking into the impairment loss you can find out but in this case it's not differentiated between exchange loss and and, and the impairment loss because non monetary items should never be translated but again and again in this case so total value should be charged as an impairment loss to the profit and loss account hence the loss of 6 million should be adjusted in the movement of inventory as a non cash flow the net effect of the statement of cash flow will be nil so once its impairment expense was added back right and one again it was deducted in decrease in inventory so the net impact is always zero cash flows from operations this net impact was always zero but examiner you need to show the examiner that you have understood the adjustment if you are going to miss or you you're going to miss this six million suppose i'm going to delete this one and again i'm going to remove the decrease in inventory with the six million the result is always the same it's 333 million right ultimate impact of this adjustment is always you but you have to have show the examiner that you have understood the concept impairment of impairment expense of inventory you have understood and this decrease in inventory levels was actually accounted for so if examiner was has asked you cash flows what was the cash flows before working capital changes that always has an impact of this impairment expense on the inventory i hope uh, this is pretty much clear to everyone and uh, we'll be looking into the next requirement of our question which was explanation we have done any working can either be shown in a made body or explanation notes explain how changes to the group structure and dividend would impact upon the consolidated statement of cash flows at 30th september 2008 for the moes group you should not attempt to alter your answer to part a you're not supposed to alter your this question but you have to explain it what is the impact of change in group structure so we're looking into what are the changes that we have made to the change in group structure so this is change in group structure changes in group structure i i, I believe I, there are two more companies during the year ended 30th september 2008 moyos acquired 60 percent of the subsidiary if a 60 percent subsidiary is acquired then 
within the opening balances of consolidated balance sheet all the assets and liabilities do, don't include the assets and liabilities of devonport within the balance sheet why because this subsidiary was no more in the in, in, during the uh, in the opening balances why because this subsidiary was acquired during the year 30th september 2008 hence closing balance should include the assets and liabilities of this subsidiary how we can account it for we need to add the opening balances or the balances of assets and liabilities of Davenport opening balance at acquisition date the balances of all the assets and liabilities of Davenport at acquisition date should be added in the opening balances of the group financial statement so we need to account it for how much amount should be included secondly if you look into it the within the cash flows from uh, investing activities you should be uh, deducting the cash outflow that cash outflow is actually based on the total amount you have paid for the acquisition of subsidiary less any cash balance any cash balance of Davenport at acquisition date should be reduced so the net impact should be reported in your uh, cash flows from investing activities via acquisition of a subsidiary as as, as having a label of acquisition from subsidiary but this should not never be accounted for within the uh, cash flows from operating activities that should always come under the heading of cash flows from investing activities so that's the main idea you you should be considering it the equity of 80 percent of the equity being acquired several years ago but we decided to sell there is another company so that's something we have updated the devonport devonport along with this not only this along with this you the dividend if you have received any dividend i think uh, the dividend was also mentioned here uh, how expense structure so first we will be answering the change in group structure and then we're looking into the div impact of dividend upon the consolidated system of cash flows what is the impact of dividend on consolidated cash flows we are done with the acquisition of Davenport, how we are going to account for the acquisition of Davenport during the year. Second thing is the consideration paid of share exchange and with some cash. So, yes, there is another thing. You have exchanged the shares. What do you think? Do you have paid the cash for Braham for cash? Davenport and also sold an equity shares in Braham for cash so right now we are not looking into the this sold subsidiary we are looking into the acquire subsidiary the consideration of Davenport consists of a share for share exchange and 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 some cash payable in two years right now right now in this year have you paid any cash for the acquisition of Davenport you have poor you have paid no cash right so with the acquisition of subsidiary you only need to deduct the value of cash you have acquired control with the acquisition of a control of Davenport, right? So that 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 don't shows any of the any of the cash inflows while sorry no no it, it's not going to show any cash outflows. It might be showing a cash inflow figure with the acquisition of subsidiary, right? But as you have exchanged the shares so the share capital has been increased right and we are going to account for the increase in share capital and equity section and and the non current liability section within the financing uh, activities cash flows from financing activities section of our cash flow statement so any new shares issued have you received any cash we have not received any cash rather we have acquired we have attained the control of Davenport hence increasing uh, shares increase in the value of share capital or a share premium account has no impact or on the cash flows so we must consider this that neither your uh, cash flows from financing activities will have been impacted with this change right and there is an other increase within your payables you have a uh, contingent consideration right now that you that you need to also oh, it's a deferred consideration so you have a deferred consideration that should be paid within the two years so you have recorded the deferred consideration uh, you have to calculate the present value of the deferred consideration based on the risk factor uh, or or the 
cost of capital of the company and uh, you have to do unwinding of discount on that um, that de that content that, that deferred consideration with that deferred consideration the liabilities have been increased but that liability don't have any impact on your cash flows from operating activities or cash flows from uh, investing or financing activities along with it you might have charged some interest to the profit and loss account right based on the present value of the debit consideration and the uh, uh, you can say in the in the work in the cost of capital so that interest even don't have any impact on your cash flows so even that interest should not be deducted from cash flows from operation activities so that should be excluded this is another consideration that you're looking into this specific aspect which was mentioned the deferred consideration if you are not mentioning these two points examiner is going not going to give you the answer because the examiner has specifically given you two options examiner must have told you that we have not paid any cash for the acquisition of davenport we have actually issued shares and committed to pay some cash which is payable in two years we have not paid any cash within the year right so 80 percent shares of the braham now we're looking into the disposal of subsidiary if you have received cash for the disposal of braham a subsidiary an 80 percent interest in, in a subsidiary you have disposed of that uh, that subsidiary 80 percent of the equity shares of braham had been acquired several years ago but moyes had decided to sell as the performance of braham had been poor for a number of years the company has not performed well the subsidiary has not performed well so have you have sold it out consequently braham as the company's performance was poor braham had a substantially overdraft at the disposal date the braham company had uh, overdraft within its books of accounts so the net figure would be suppose I'm, I'm 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 just giving you an example here you have received cash for disposal of braham which equals suppose which equals 100 million and you have to net off the cash the control of the cash you have lost in this case there is no cash balance available there is an overdraft facility which you have you have lost a liability you are not supposed to pay this overdraft anymore because you don't have the subsidiary under your control so you need to add this suppose it's 10 million so you have to add it the total value that should be reported in cash flows from investing activities would be sale proceed of a subsidy was 110 million you need to explain it in your words within your exam so we'll be looking into the answer right now but we are now creating our answer how we need to look into the total aspect of our scenario so i'm taking up or i'm snatching the words from the scenario to make up my answer rather i'm developing my own something right so you need to be very careful how you need how you're going to develop your answer it's actually based on the standards it's nothing uh, it's nothing based on some something you need to generate it it's something you have already studied the standards you have already gone through the standard you have a knowledge of standards and now <coughs> apologies <coughs> sorry you need to apply those standards to this that specific scenario and i'm doing the same thing i'm not doing anything else i'm just picking up the words from the scenario and and making sure that i am explaining the standard what standard say for that specific situation next thing is braham was unable to pay any dividend during the financial year but devonport did pay an interim dividend on 30th september 2008 now one more thing examiner has specifically told you that you're not supposed to change you're not supposed to amend or modify your a standard uh, you know you're not supposed to modify your workings in your section a right so we'll be looking into it why we're not changing it the, in this case as Braham have was unable to pay any dividend so if there is any dividend that dividend income should be reported in your um, cash flows from either from operations but as you are working on consolidated financial statement if it's an individual financial statement then any dividend received from either braham or davenport that should be accounted for as an income uh, from uh, a subsidiary income from 
investments yeah, in, or investment income you you will be you will be looking into that investment but if you are looking into the consolidated financial statements you have to eliminate any dividend you have received from a subsidiary so in this case there is no dividend income reported in this profit before tax you cannot amend it you have not received any dividend either from Devonport or from Ram, but as no dividend from received from Ram, so there is no change within the financial statement, within the cash flow statements with respect to Graham, the company you have disposed of. But as Devonport has paid you the dividend within the year, that dividend should be reported under income from investing activities and you have to report that amount you have received within your group financial statements group uh, or, or the consolidated financial statement but ultimately if i'm saying it oh, sorry in, in individual financial statement that should be reported in in your uh in, in income from associates so income from um yeah or, or cash received from subsidiary or investment but in consolidated financial statement as the parent or as subsidiary has declared the dividend that dividend was the cash paid out by the subsidiary and that cash was ultimately received by the parent company so the cash balance parent plus subsidiary you have added up in your consolidated balance sheet so there is no impact on your cash uh, receipt receipts and uh, along with it your retained earning irrespective either it's parent or subsidy that was increased so the impact of the dividend paid by the subsidy was only on the nci working it has no impact in consolidated cash flows on the parent company are you getting the point um in, you should be comparing what is done within the individual financial statement and where we, what we are going to do in consolidated financial statement as we have eliminated any dividend income received from the subsidiary during consolidation process right so only the 80 percent of the dividend paid by the subsidiary company that is devonport i believe we have 80 percent investment in devonport or 60 percent 60 percent of the dividend that was paid by the devonport should have no impact on your cash flows but the 40 percent of the dividend must have reduced the nci value the non-controlling interest value and that should be reported in your cash flows from financing activities because if you're looking into the equity section non-controlling interest should always be reported in the equity section and we have already discussed that equity section and non liability section should be reported in cash flows from financing activities so any decrease in your non-controlling interest for which you have paid the cash actually should be accounted for under cash flows from financing activities rather in investing activities right so that that's that's how it has impacted your cash flows we'll be looking into answer we'll be studying it how the examiner has answered it and how how the examiner has developed that answer so this is something when the parent companies acquire or sell a subsidiary during the financial year cash flows arising from the acquisition or disposal are presented within the investing activities and we have understood the same thing in relation to devonport no cash consideration have been paid during the current year since the consideration consisted of a share for share exchange and some deferred cash so the deferred cash should be presented as a negative cash flow within the investing activities but only when paid in two years time right now it should not be accounted for this does not mean that there would be no impact in the current year statement of cash flows on the gaining control moyos would consolidate 100 percent of the assets and liabilities of devonport which would presumably increase some cash and cash equivalent at the date of acquisition right the cash of the subsidiary so these would be presented as a cash inflow at the rate of acquisition net of any overdraft held at acquisition i believe uh davenport might not have an overdraft but you have to explain it if there is an overdraft that should be accounted for because uh, if you're looking into the format of our cash and cash flows ca cash and cash uh, equivalents we find out that cash balances and overdraft balances should always be treated as cash and cash equivalent balances adjustments would also need to be made to the opening balance of assets and liabilities by adding the fair values of the identifiable net assets at the acquisition date to the respective balances this would be necessary to ensure that only the cash flows effects are reported in consolidated statement of cash flows rather the 
total assets rather than the increase in assets due to the acquisition of subsidiary subsidiary fair values adjustment to the assets and liabilities could also have a deferred tax effect so yes that's something we have missed right so when you are increasing the fair value of an asset that must have a deferred tax expect a deferred tax effect so that the tax extract should also have to be adjusted for and the cash payments for tax included within the set of cash flows should be included when you are including up, updating cash flows from operating activities so you have to um, adjust the tax payment within the cash flows from operating activities so if there is any deferred tax impact due to the fair value adjustment that should also be accounted for dividend received by the moes from devonport are not included in consolidated statement of cash flows since cash has in effect been transferred from one group member to another group member so once if you're looking into individual cash flows that must have an impact but once you're looking into consolidated cash flows that has no impact because the cash paid by the subsidies was ultimately received by the parent company and when you are consolidating up you are adding up parent cash plus the subsidiary's cash so if the subsidiary had had paid a cash amount and and that was received by the parent company so the 60% cash has no impact only 40% of the cash that was paid to the non controlling interest which is not part of the group that should be adjusted but that should be adjusted from cash flows from financing activities i hope uh, if this this answer is a sample answer right so if you have missed one item like we have missed this deferred tax i'm not asking you guys i'm not asking or, or advising anyone to 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 miss some point and expect the examiner not to deduct the scores the examiner is going to deduct it but i would recommend within sbr syllabus no answer is 100% correct and no answer is 100% incorrect as far as you are justifying your answer as far as you are justifying your answer based on international accounting standards based on ifrs recommendation your answer is correct two individuals sitting in the same exam of sbr and giving a different opinion on a same scenario based on their understanding in the application of the standard what they understand it's 100% correct for example if examiner has given me uh, a question on which he has provided me with the investment property and he told me and the examiner asked me how i'm going to account for the investment property within my books of accounts so i'm assuming it that investment property should be carried at cost model so i'm giving him an explanation how the cost model on investment properties actually works while another student or another another individual who considered that investment property should be carried at fair value so he is answering his question based on the fair value measurement both of the answers of those two individual is correct as far as you are applying the ifrs in a correct manner are you getting the point if you are not explaining the ifrs in the correct manner only then it's it's not something that's giving you the good scores if or, or, or the examiner is going to deduct your scores right okay next thing is another thing that we have missed on the disposal of Abraham, the net assets at the disposal date including goodwill are removed from consolidated financial statements since Abraham is overdrawn there will have a positive cash flow effect of the group the overdraft will be added to the proceeds less any cash and cash equivalent at the disposal rate if there is any to give an overall inflow presented in investing activities care would once again be necessary to ensure that all balances at the disposal date are removed from the corresponding assets and liabilities so that only cash flows are recorded within the consolidated statement of cash flow so that's the main idea of uh, of uh, ifrs when you are applying it so this question is this question is purely related to ifrs this section is question number uh, one section b is purely based on the application of ifrs 10 purely this this specific section this these six marks i believe is the six marks yes no these, these these six marks yes these six marks are purely for the application of ifrs 10 in this examiner has not tested any other standard 
right next is advise the director on as to whether watson should classify it as watson a company that was held for sale i believe whether both held for sale or whether both it and braham would be classified as discontinued operation so uh, discontinued operation we have one this section as well the directors of moyos wish to advise as to whether disposal of braham should be treated as a discontinued operation the above subsidiary that was already disposed of if if it should be treated as a discontinued operation and separately disclosed within the consolidated statement of profit and loss account there are several other subsidiaries which are which which all produce similar products to Braham to operate in a similar geographical area additionally moyos hold a 52% equity interest in watson watson has previously issued share option to other entities which are exercisable in the year ending 30th september 2009 so they, they, this this watson has a different scenario watson is a subsidiary in which moyes company has a 52% equity in trust watson previously issued some share options to some of the individuals i hope you all of you have an understanding of ifrs2 share based payments or a share options that that is given to the employees who can uh, acquire that share options and if the employees have acquired the share to other entities to employees or to the other entities if those entities have exercise their option in the year ending 30th september 2009 the next year it is likely highly likely that these option would be exercised which would reduce moyos interest to 35% so it's no more a subsidiary of moyes company but it should be treated as an associate because you have lost the control over the subsidiary the director of moyes required advice as to whether the loss of control would be required would require watson to be classified as held for sale and uh, and reclassified as discontinued operation so for both of these two subsidiaries whether they should be accounted for as either non as either discontinued operation or not so before looking into uh, the specific criteria that we are going to classify these two subsidiaries as this kind of operation we need to make sure we have an understanding of ifrs5 what ifrs5 say about about any operations that should be placed as as a discontinued operation so i'm i'm moving to ifrs5 where we need to get a basic understanding of how any item should be accounted for under IFRS. So this is IFRS 5. The main objective of this standard is accounting for non-current asset and cash generating unit for which management had intended to recover. You need to make sure what was the criteria. The objective of this standard is to make sure if any non-current asset or a cash generating unit, a group of assets, a group of assets that has a capability of managing its own cash flows cash inflows and cash outflows it's generating its own cash flows and it's it's meeting its own cash outflows expectation without depending upon any other department of the organization for example in the subsidiary the braham company and the other watson company both of these two companies are independent units they are managing their own cash flows they are not depending upon the parent for 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 meeting their cash outflows and they are not depending upon the parent company to to help them out for the cash inflows so these two both watson and 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 the uh, braham should be considered as as cash generating units in this case so what is the recognition criteria so there are certain conditions those were defined by ifrs5 one thing non asset or disposal group is available for sale in its current condition you don't plan to modify any non current asset before disposal or you want to improve the discontinued operation or a disposal group before disposal you have placed both the disposal group and the discontinued operation with an intention that this should be disposed of in its present condition second is you have planned it that you are going to dispose this off and the sale is highly probable within the next 12 months and how you need to make sure how you are going to account for it that the sale is highly probable there are three main criteria for for this for this surety of the probability one thing is uh, 
management is committed to to do the plan to do the sale plan to uh, management is committed to the sale plan this the management of the company is committed they are not going to withdraw this sale plan they are actively locating for a buyer and the price was reasonably charged if these three conditions are met only then you can consider that the sale is highly probable if management suppose i am considering it if management is committed for a sale plan and management is actively locating for a buyer but the price charged by the manager was those way high compared to the market value of this non current asset or disposal group then do you think the sale is probable highly probable in 12 months it never going to possible no one is going to pay you a higher value than the market value of that specific item so that's not meeting the probable criteria last thing is management is not pursuing any other plan whether the assets or a disposal group can be can be used <clears throat> management is not looking into any other plan what what they are going to carry out so in this case i'm not going to look at, I'm, i'm not considering it the rest of the criteria is how initial and subsequent measurement of ifrs 5 or or a non current asset or cash netting it should be applied but in this case as examiner has only asked us in this case only asked us so i have told you you need to be look you need to be considering what was the actual requirement you need to advise whether this should be classified as held for sale or not that's the only criteria examiner has never asked you has not asked you in this in this specific requirement that if it is held for if it is considered as discounted operation how we are going to account it for so that's not the requirement of this scenario so we are only looking into these basic criteria so you need to start your answer with 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 an understanding that whether this should be considered as a discounted operation or not so in this in this specific question you should be asking yourself with respect to braham if you find anything within the scenario within the scenario within the situation provided by the examiner if this could be meeting the conditions i have mentioned within within i uh, uh, the conditions those are mentioned with ifrs 5 so if i'm looking into it moyos the braham company from the from the last last scenario i find out that the braham company was acquired several years ago but <clears throat> as the performance of braham company was not as expected by the company so that's why it could be possible that 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 moyes companies might have considered this company to dispose of before disposing it off because it's not performing as per the expectation of the of the of the parent company so it is possible if the three criteria as we have mentioned you you need to start your answer with ifrs 5 explanation right the the uh, the requirements we have mentioned and then you are going to evaluate it post braham either braham is meeting those expectation as far as the scenario is concerned i think that the braham company for the braham company these conditions might be met because the performance of the company was not good and it is possible that the moyes company management might have considered all those criteria those were mentioned i for s5 before disposing it off because from this scenario it's clearly visible that management must have a plan to dispose of braham company this sale was not out of sudden this sale was because of the poor performance of the company from number of years so moyes company's management might have might have looked into the aspect if they can improve the performance of a company or not as the performance of company was not improved from many years hence directors might have planned to dispose of moyes com of uh, braham companies from last many years and the disposal was can and if the conditions was met and if the management has an expectation management has a true plan which is not provided within the scenario so we can consider so we can uh, uh, uh we can place braham company as discounted operation and can report it the results of braham company uh as separately in consolidated 
income statement and consolidated balance sheet, the assets and liabilities of that specific company. Next thing is your Watson company. For Watson company, do you think those criteria are met? Company has never thought of placing or disposing of that subsidiary. The control of the subsidiary was lost because the Watson company has already issued some share option to other entities. And when those entities are going to exercise those share option, the control on Watson companies was lost. In, in this situation, I don't have find out any scenario where Moyo's management has any plan to dispose of this Watson company. They are not going to dispose it off. That was actually the loss. The control was lost because of the new shares issued by Watson, rather the disposal of this subsidiary by the Moyo's company. So as far as Watson is concerned, it's, it's <clears throat> clearly visible from the situation that it can never be placed as a discounted operation under IFRS 5 by Moe's company. So you have explained it and you have mentioned all the aspects. So looking into the answer, I'm going to read out that answer, uh, answer C. I believe that's answer C. This, this is the answer C. We'll be just going through this answer very quickly and then we'll be winding it up and, and looking into the next requirement, which is very important, uh, the framework criteria. IFRSI non-print asset, <coughs> sorry, non-print asset held for sale and discounted operation defines a discounted operation as a component of entity which was either being disposed of or classified as held for sale and represents a separate major line of business or a geographic area of operation that we have already discussed is a single coordinated plan and there is a single coordinated plan to dispose of separate major line of business operations and is a subsidiary or acquired exclusively for sale so this is something this has defined what a discontinued operation actually means to the uh, actually means under ifrs5 this is the explanation of discontinued operation over here the examiner has has explained next is both entities would be component of moyo's group since their operations and cash flows are clearly distinguishable for the reporting purposes braham had been sold during the year but there appears to be other subsidiaries which operate in a similar geographical region and produce similar products little guidance is given as to what as, as to what would constitute a separate major line of business or geographical area of the operation the definition is subjective and the directors should consider factors such as materiality and in relevance before determining whether braham should be presented as competition or, or not to be classified as help or sale um, to be highly probable the entity should be available for sale in its present condition ifrs5 requirement at a face value Watson would not appear to meet this definition as no sale transaction is going to take place. You are losing the control of Watson company because of, of, of the increase in share. IFRS 5 does not explicitly extend the requirement for help for sale in situation where the control is lost. It's not mentioned within IFRS 5. However, the International Accounting Standard Board have confirmed that the instances their controls is lost, the subsidiary and liabilities to be recognized, loss of control is a significant economic in, a, a, event and fundamental changes in investor investor relationship. Therefore, <clears throat> situation where the parent is committed to lose control should trigger the reclassification as held for sale. Whether this should extend to the situation uh, where the control is lost or otherwise cause would be judgmental. It is also possible that therefore Watson should be classified as health for sale, but to be classified as this kind of operation, Watson would need to be represent a separate line of business or a geographical area. In this situation, examiner has provided two different answers to the situation. We have only considered the one aspect when we are answering to the question that this is not mentioned within IFRS 5 and this is not going to take place with, with a single uh, sale criteria and as IFRS 5 has not mentioned any situation within it within its standard body so we are not going to place Watson on the basis of losing the control as this country operation or, uh, or, or, or a separate cash generating unit that would be disposed of but as far as the framework is concerned as the control of the subsidiary was changed. So now over here, the framework guidelines comes in and 
as the framework tells when there is a change in the control or if there is a major change within the control of a subsidiary then you have to place you have to consider that subsidiary as this control operation but before this you need to make sure that watson is, must represent a separate line of business as a geographical uh, separate line of business or geographical area or or separate operation entity uh, for the group only then you can place this specific um, watson company as a discounted operation so that's something um, another idea was given by the examiner so that's that's a good idea for us that we have to include framework as well within our within uh, within the question when we are answering that specific question last requirement was related to um, the framework guidelines and uh, this framework guideline we have already discussed and and i'm going to reading out once again the main requirement body of 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 that i uh, that that framework requirement and this is the scenario that was provided by by the examiner and the examiner is going to has asked you how the new criterion have been applied consistently across accounting standard illustrate your answer with reference to how there may be inconsistencies with the measurement of intangible assets provision in contingent consideration also explain how to change in conceptual framework impact the existing standards the the change you have made to the conceptual framework the asset definition of assets and liabilities the recognition criteria measurement that that was changed how it has impacted the existing standards so I, i'm just going to because we have left with just three minutes i'm just going quickly going through the answer uh, to make sure that we're not involved in detailed discussion uh, that's the answer i have mentioned it's basically oh sorry it's another question that we'll be looking into it uh, tomorrow this this is a detailed answer actually i have updated because this is not an examiner answer this is something i have updated and uh, you need to make sure what was the main answer. so this is different accounting center using different levels of probabilities and we always know that that the criteria of the criteria of recognition provided by most of the accounting center was there must be three recognition that is those must be met those must be met one or two basic criteria one is the cost of the asset should be liability measured and second criteria if you're looking into is 16 or is 2 the recognition criteria is that the cost of any asset should be liability measured and second one is it is problem that inflow of economic benefit should run towards the entity right so most of the uh, international accounting standard should follow the same criteria different accounting standard use different level of probabilities to discuss when assets and liabilities should be recognized in financial statement for example economic benefits from property plant and equipment and intangible asset need to be probably to be recognized to be classified as help or sale or to be highly probable under is this is this these two three standard if is 16 is 38 ifrs 5 should say that it's highly probable that 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 uh, the economic benefit flows towards the entity while is 37 what it mentions for contingent liabilities and contingent assets provision it should mention that provision should be recorded if it is probable a provision is a liability it should be recognized when it's probable that the outflow of economic benefit should be done while in the same time is 37 mentioned for the asset that asset should only be recognized if it is virtually certain to that the inflow of economic benefit would arise as a result of that 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 contingent asset or or the asset you're going to recognize right so that's the different criteria provided by uncertain assets on the other hand would have been virtually certain this could lead to a situation where two sides of the same court case this is this is an example just mentioned if a court case was uh, was held within the court there is one party who's claiming for the damages and other party who's defending for the damage that it's not my fault that i have to pay the damages and the party insists on that it's the fault of the other party and i am going to claim the damages if it's probable if it's probable that entity a 
which is defending the claim that the entity a is probably have to pay the entity b while the entity b for, for entity b which is claiming for the damages it's probable that entity b will be receive the damages but entity a under is 37 entity a must have to recognize a liability on the same time at the same time entity b which is going to claim it cannot recognize an asset irrespective both parties have a same probability criteria one party have to recognize it and other party is not allowed to recognize it under is 37 criteria right so that's the different aspect and that that should be recorded the contingent consideration is recognized in the financial statement regardless of the level of probability uh the contingent consideration you might have uh, understood the, under a consolidated financial statement the contingent consideration you have to record it rather the fair value is adjusted to reflect the level of uncertainty of the contingent consideration you have to adjust the fair value of that item to make sure that uncertainty was accounted for next thing is why the change in uh the framework the conceptual framework has not impacted the definitions of assets and liabilities within the accounting standard this is the board has confirmed a new approach to recognition criteria which requires decision to be made with reference to the qualitative characteristics of financial information an entity should now recognize it's under the conceptual framework an entity should have to recognize an asset or liability if such recognition provides users of financial statement with more relevant and faithful representation of assets and liabilities and information which results in benefits exceeding the cost of information so these are the two recognition criteria based on the fundamental qualitative characteristics if providing any assets or liabilities within the financial statement provide more relevant and faithful representation of an asset and liability that should be recognized and then providing the information within the financial statement would would give more benefit compared to the cost associated with that specific asset so that's that's the criteria of uh, of i i i s uh, this is the main idea of conceptual framework a key change here is to remove the probability criterion that that's something uh, the new framework has changed the new framework has changed the probability criterion this means that more assets and liabilities with the low probability of inflow or outflow of economic resources are likely to be recognized now with the change in probability criterion the more assets and liabilities can be recognized within your uh, financial statement the board accepts the structured prudence can still means there will be inconsistency recognition as and liabilities within the financial reporting standard but maybe necessarily consequences of providing the most useful information for the stakeholders the board has acknowledged that some ifrs do include a probability criterion of recognizing assets and liabilities for example is 37 provisions contingent liabilities and asset states that provision can only be recorded if there is a probable outflow of economic benefit while is 38 intangible assets highlights that for development cost to be recognized there must be a probability that economic benefit will arise from the development towards the entity the change to the definition of assets and liabilities will leave these unaffected the board has explained that these standards don't rely on the argument that items fail to meet the definition of assets and liabilities instead these standards include probability probable outflows or inflows as a criterion for recognition the board believes that this is uncertainty the, the board believe that this uncertainty is the best dealt with the recognition or measurement of items rather than in the definition of assets and liabilities so for these two standards is 37 and is 38 for uh, for the for, for development criteria the board has not changed the definition or not changed the recognition criteria based on those items or based on the changes in conceptual framework definition so that's the main idea of i uh, the new conceptual framework if anyone has any concern right now with respect to this do let me know and we'll be um,
we'll be uh, coming back with another scenario i i have already shared with you this next question that was that should be account we are going to account it for the same question it's a consolidation question as uh, consolidation constitute the majority of the scores and uh, most of the course uh, was accounted for within these two sections so i'll be looking into another question tomorrow with from the same um, section this is question two and this question is actually related to consolidation uh, i recommend all of you to go through this question and uh, look into the things that that confuse you uh, you guys so we'll be focusing on those items more but uh, i'll be looking into this question <clears throat> tomorrow and we'll be answering your question <clears throat> with respect to this specific section and then we're looking into the next uh, portion the next question of uh, the next question section of our paper that's the question two which is uh, related to the evaluation aspect section one and question two which is mainly related to <clears throat> ethical implications and reporting implication of specific events we'll be looking into how standard was applied by the management and how the accounting standard actually explained these standards should be applied any question as of now do let me know otherwise uh, uh yes I, I i looked into your questions later and uh, i found out that the screen was stuck surely that would not going to happen tomorrow yes i i am actually receiving the messages unfortunately that was something uh, i missed to uh, account for i unfortunately this was the pause was the pause button was clicked for the screen and that was not resumed again that was my mistake apologies once again so uh tomorrow it is not going to happen tomorrow okay thank you guys if there is no further question uh, then we'll be okay i know but uh, that is something uh, i'll be more careful by tomorrow that i'm not going to uh, pause the screen unfortunately i i don't i don't know when it was clicked out so i missed it but uh, it will not going to happen tomorrow thanks all and uh, we'll be meeting tomorrow question 1c uh, give me a second Question 1C. Question 1C is related to as held for sale. Since this held for sale must meet the uh, IFRS 5 criteria. So, as far as the situation of Watson or uh, Braham was concerned, you can clearly say that for Braham, the company might have a plan to uh, place this subsidiary as as a discontinued operations well before uh, you you're going to dispose of dispose of this subsidiary why because braham was making loss from last many years so the management might have planned for it so once we know the actual criteria or actual <clears throat> understanding of the management about the braham then we can place that uh, Braham as as a discount operation, but before placing this Braham as a discount operation, we must make sure that Braham is an independent unit that is that is capable of <clears throat> the capable of generating its own cash flow. That that's uh, a criteria that was mentioned here. That discount operation should be uh, just 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 a minute. This is this must be a separate line of business a separate major line of business and which is very clear with the name that it is a subsidiary as it is a subsidiary so it must have a separate major line of business and, and a geographically or an operation so you can place braham as as a discounted operation while for watson as watson does not appear to meet the definition of uh, non current asset held for sale why because you are not selling watson the control was actually lost why because because the change in the 
capital in the share structure of the company. Company has issued some effective share options. If and, and when these options would be exercised within the next year, this subsidiary is the Watson is no more would remain the subsidiary of of Moyes the group, right? Then if the structure of the company, if the uh, if the status of the company has been changed within the Moyes group, which is which is because of the loss of control. So based on the framework guidelines and the IFRS trend guidelines, if the control was lost in which you know that the controls were lost, then you can place Watson Group even as a discontinued operation, but that was not mentioned within IFRS 5 guidelines. IFRS 5 does not provide you any guideline about uh, about placing a company or a cash generating unit or a group of assets or a separate business entity as a discontinued operation if you are losing control of that specific entity over here you are just losing the control you're not disposing of any stake in Watson company are you getting the point so based on this lost control you can place uh, even Watson as a discontinued operation, but once you are explaining it, why you have placed in this uh, specific section as a discontinued operation, you must be explaining to the stakeholders that the main reason of placing this uh, Watson company as discontinued operation because of the lost control, right? Any any other question? If if anyone has. Uh, this question was actually answered to this question was over already uh, shared with you guys. I believe it's uh, <clears throat> in handouts. Uh, you would be you would be provided with these documents. You can download those documents from from handouts. So the answer was already available. Thank you everyone and uh, surely we'll meet tomorrow. Uh, thank you so very much.